Welcome to another edition of Just Thinking. I'm Mary Greendale, and joining me again today for our quarterly report and update is Representative Carolyn Dykema. Welcome, Carolyn. Thank you, Mary. Happy, happy New here. Year. Yes, Happy yes, New Year to 2020. you. 2020. Hard can, to believe yeah, it is already. I, I can remember when it was just, you know, the TV show or what your vision was supposed to be, but here it is for real. You know, it's a whole year. And 60 degrees. So. And it's 60 degrees, and who knows about that. Is that global warming? Let's not go there. Anyway, so how have things been? How have you been? Good. Good. Everything is great. Had a great holiday. We're empty nesters now, as I think you knew, so we had all the kids home at yeah. once, which doesn't happen that often, so it was nice. That's good. But good, glad good. to be back at it for the new year. And does it look like it'll be a busy one? It will be really busy. Yeah. Yeah, with transportation at the top of the list that's been talked about. We were going to take it up in the house Yeah. in uh, the fall, and that got pushed back, so now we're actively meeting with people in the building talking about priorities, and I expect that will be coming up in the next few months. Well, that's where I wanted to start, so let's do that. So what are the priorities from the state's perspective? Sure. So um, one of the things that we had talked about was public transit, mm -hmm. and that's high on my radar. And there, there are things on the state perspective that we're talking about, things like uh, buses and the T. From our district, obviously, um, there are different priorities, yeah. one of which is the commuter rail. Mm. Um, and, you know, the Mass Pike congestion is what everybody's talking about, right? right. I think any of us who have been here for any period of yeah. time in the last five to ten years have seen the dramatic congestion. So it's about how do we find solutions for congestion. It's about how do we meet the needs of our employers by moving employees, you know, either into the city or in our case from out of the, you know, from the city out to our way. And just quality of life, you know, it just takes too long to get everywhere. So we're looking at everything from new revenue potentially to start paying for upgrades to commuter rail, MBTA, um, buses, to things like creative incentives for how can we um, encourage employers to offer, um, on, you know, work from home or flexible schedules or anything that we can do to kind of move the cars off the road. And you mentioned climate change, you know, that's obviously a piece of this yeah. is how do we, um, knowing that transportation sector is about 30 percent of our overall um, emissions here in Massachusetts. Yeah. If we're going to be serious about tackling climate, we need to tackle transportation. So all of that will be part of the conversation. Which looks the most likely? Uh, Any one of those things got a chance? Well, <laughs> um, I, I'd say the most, the, the idea for revenue, I assume yeah. is what you're talking about, that seems to have the most support is what's called TCI or a transportation climate initiative. Is this the regional one? This is, is the regional one. So okay. it's essentially um, what most people think of as a carbon tax, yeah. but it's regional regional um, in nature. There are, uh, I believe it's nine states in D.C. that are involved now. They're actively negotiating to come to uh, an agreement on how the program would be structured. And uh, the governor and uh, Secretary Thea Herides from EEA here in Mass are kind of leading the charge. Massachusetts is clearly... Uh, leading on this effort, and so that's expected. If if that happens, um, and there's a lot of details still to be yeah. discussed, it, they're looking at you know 2022 for implementation. Now, as I under have understood from what I've read or heard, the, it's really a, a user fee as opposed to a tax. I draw the distinction. The only way in my head that I can think about it is I'm taxed for things I don't use. You know, I mean, I don't have children in the public schools. Okay, I have grandchildren, but. But fees are something that I actually do. I, I impose a cost. I use a program at the at the camp, or I, you know, my water. Um, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't. I I may not want to pay the fee for the seventy five dollars, but yeah, I'm going to be using that. When you when you talk about this carbon tax kind of thing, what are you talking about? How do they get those revenues? Well, for TCI in particular, it's a it's what you call cap and invest. So there is a cap on the amount of emissions that can be. Um, expended out of the transportation sector, and it would, there would be uh, an associated cost on the, at the wholesale level is what it's looking like. So if you go above whatever that limit is, and that limit declines over time, then you have to pay, you know, an additional amount of money into a into a kitty that would then be used to fund transportation needs. So um, it's really more um, a pass through from the wholesaler to the, um, you know, the user. Unlike a gas tax, which is actually, you know, on a, a per really gallon basis, this yeah. is really kind of a, a one fee that will be 
amortized all right. over everybody. Okay, okay, all right. And uh, so what, uh, and the next more vi most viable uh, You know, looking at things like, and this is kind of a small, small thing, but more fees on TNCs, so Lyft and Uber, you know, you could, you could tax those to some extent. Um, you could do gas tax is is always on the actually I, to me that's the fairest one but that's just that's just me you know I'd welcome input from people on that that yeah. one seems to be truthfully the most polarizing I know and I and, and that's and maybe that makes sense but it's like geez if I'm the one that's you know I'm paying it when I'm using it yeah I if, think the challenge with that one is regional equity Mm -hmm. Which is something that always comes up in these yeah, debates throughout right? the rural who communities. Who pays and then who gets the benefit? And I think one of the concerns about the gas tax, especially for like western parts of the yeah. state, yeah. you know, they have to drive more. They don't have public transit. Are they going to, you know, fully get the benefit back to their region that you know they're paying in? So that's all part of the negotiation that's yeah, happening. That's a formula, you know. That seems to me that that's a formula. But you talk about communities that have to drive distances. I mean, I have a saying that uh, Holliston's eight miles from everything. You know, if you want to go to the doctor, it's eight miles. If you want to go to the, the store, it's eight miles. Mm -hmm. I mean, to get to the bigger outlets and that kind of stuff, I mean, I feel like I'm in the car constantly and I don't go far. Right. You know? Well, and then the other thing that we have to talk about in this region is tolls. Right. I mean, we pay tolls. Not a whole lot of other people pay tolls. There's some folks on the North Shore that do. So our, one of the priorities for our delegation, we're actually meeting with Ways and Means tomorrow as a group. Um, we're going to be talking about tolls and how, you know, an increase in tolls, absent some fairness around who pays toll. I mean, we don't want an increase, period, um, but certainly not an increase without, you know, sharing the wealth. And whether that be tolls at the borders or tolls on other major roadways, which does have some federal implications on what we can and can't do. But that really needs to be part of the conversation from our Metro West standpoint. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And then in terms of the public transit, the MBTA and that kind of stuff, I'm assuming all of that is sort of just swirling around inside, funding it, up, whether to provide additional revenues or not. And even the debate goes all the way up to the governor, and he's less inclined to need new revenues, and everybody else wants to give him money, and he just doesn't want yeah. to take it. <laughs> well, there's a few things going on here. So, you know, I think everyone can agree that investment in public transit, especially given the reliability concerns on both the core yeah. T system mm -hmm. and the commuter rail, are needed and yeah. important. I guess my, you know, a few things that I think about, one is we've been putting a lot of investment into these systems for a while now. You know, ever since 2014, the governor kind of made it his mm -hmm. priority after the snowstorm and the big uh, reliability impacts to, to fix the T. Yeah. And you know, there's been a tremendous amount of effort on the T and it's, folks really aren't seeing it. You know, we're seeing know. some of that along the Worcester Framingham line. But not like you would think with the amount of effort and attention that it's been getting. So that's a question about management. You know, is the management structure what it needs to be if we're mm -hmm. going to put more money into that? The Fiscal Management Control Board, which the governor requested of the legislature mm -hmm. and we authorized in back in 2014-15, is expiring in June, I believe it is. Oh. And that's been a critical oversight mm -hmm. entity to make sure that whatever money we're putting in is, you know, used efficiently and effectively. We have to figure out what we're, you know, what's going to happen there. Are we going to replace that with something? Is it a whole new structure? Uh, I don't know. And then, you know, the equity piece is important. The other thing that keeps coming up over and over again is the lack of talent and workforce. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, I guess, flip sides of a great economy mm -hmm. is that you can't find mm -hmm. the people that you need. So there are a lot of positions or, or roles that could be created that I think would be helpful for us, but you just can't find the people. Mm. So there are there are a lot of things that we need to to take a look at. That's a toughie. It is. That's a toughie. And when we talk about transit, I think the things we can't forget about are roads. Also, mm. you know, this this is a broader conversation that includes roads and bridges, uh, which a lot of which are really safety concerns that we need to get fixed. And then if you just keep going, if you really want to get people off the roads, that at least in in the central areas, you've got to do something with sidewalks. You know, if you don't give a, peer, a person an option, whether it's a bike lane or a sidewalk, yeah. and it's not going to do wholesale change in the city, could do a lot more out here in terms of getting people out of cars, because there are things that you can do, you right. know, just to walk to. So, I don't know. That's a comp it's very complex. It is. And one of the things, actually, Robert Widenack, who, you uh -huh. know, is a big trails person here, um, CSX, part of our challenge in Holliston in getting this trail was acquiring 
the Blue property Hacks, from CSX. Yeah. CSX is now looking to uh, divest itself of a big section in Framingham. Mm -hmm. And Sherburn, which would connect oh, our Holliston piece, piece oh, right to the Framingham train station oh, on the yeah. commuter rail. So, be, you know, yeah. thinking strategically, we absolutely should to try to make sure to acquire that so yeah. that we can connect to get people on bikes. You know, why yeah. not have bikes? Yeah, well, there people are people who do commute, you know, um, to jobs and stuff along the rail trail. There's no question there mm -hmm. are a few places in town that that can work. But right from the beginning, right from the get-go, the attractive feature was that it could get you to the train. I mean, in the spring, in the good weather and that kind of stuff, what a, what a great way to do it. Right. Great way to do it. So, and I'm glad Robert's retired. Oh. Now he's got plenty of time to <laughs> take on these He's got all challenges. that much more time. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, the other thing that I um, have to mention when it comes to transportation, because it factors into all of the things that we've just talked about, is the reconstruction of the Alston yeah. Viaduct project, which is going to decrease lanes on the pike and um, more than likely decrease service on the commuter rail mm -hmm. for uh, eight to ten years. So one That's of our... such a killer. There was one proposal to go under the river, and I mean, I know that, you know, it was yesterday, I think it was, it was online, uh, two different folks, Gary, somebody maybe. Anyway, um, you know, that the, 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 big, the big picture for the future would be just to put whatever we're doing under the river. And... And mind you, I didn't read the whole article or anything else. Like I think that. they're looking to go out over the river. Actually, they're they're looking to go out over the Charles. No, this was under. This was this was the far edge. This was the outside thinking. Okay. This is the non-traditional. Okay, so we had tradition versus non-tradition, and and this non-traditionalist was saying, 40 years from now, you're going to be talking about going under the river. Go under the river now. Don't wait. Um, but at any rate, just reading all of the things, the pike going from eight lanes to six, mm -hmm. or the commuter rail being, you know, limited. I mean, the commuter rail has been just, it's a, it's a blessing if you can get on and go and use it. You know, it's a great way to do it. That's how I was able to do it. But nowadays, it's just so, the schedule is not all that friendly and, you know, it's always so crowded. I don't know how you. What happens in that six to eight to ten years? Are, mm -hmm. Is that part of, you know, what's the, right? What's the plan? You, so we're pushing for yeah. a mitigation plan. I um, mean, the the economy can collapse in that six years yeah. totally. You know, a whole lot of businesses can decide to leave and be in elsewhere. So I mean, the mitigation plan is almost as important, or maybe even more important than the actual construction plans. Those are technical. The other stuff, that soft stuff, seems mm. to me to be even more critical. That, And I wonder if it isn't possible to back into it by starting with the mitigation plan that says, you know, you, eight lanes down to six, this is what happens, and now you start looking at, you know, what are the businesses that are directly infected, and are you talking to them? Do they talk to the businesses that are in that area that, you know? Right. And that's one of our priority Oof. asks for our region is to set up a formal structure mm. to have this conversation about mitigation, have a formal deliverable date where we have to have a plan, get all parties to the table so that we can talk about, you know, does Massport need to be involved, the MBTA, MassDOT, kind of pull people out of their silos and put them in a room together ongoing mm. to not only create a plan, but also to have an ongoing dialogue throughout the extension of the project to make sure that you know we anticipate any issues that we might not have expected, um, we respond quickly to other issues, and we truly have the open communication. And the other part to this is that there is more than one big project going on that's going to impact our corridor. So there's that project. There's what's called an air rights project, which is at the Pike and Mass Ave, where they're moving the on-ramp to Mass Ave and uh, putting a big development project. So that's going to results in lane closures for some period of time, which they're, they're looking at. And then out here in our neighborhood, we're redoing the, the I-90, 495 interchange uh, reconstruction project. So, and, and then all of the smaller projects, you know, just the regular projects that happen um, are all affecting our quarter, and we need to lay those all out and make sure that they're staggered and that they aren't just, you know, immobilizing commuters for, from our region into the city. I just hope all of the businesses are paying attention and that they really weigh in early enough to give, you know, state state executives and, and mm. planners enough time to be able to factor in all the considerations. Well, we need to reach out to them. Yeah. And what I'd like to see is to be able to offer them some incentives for, yeah. you know, letting people work from home mm -hmm. or uh, off flexible schedules or, or offset yeah. schedules or something to 
keep people from being on the road during that peak commuter mm -hmm. hour. Hour, hour, I hour, yeah. four hours is what I should have said. <laughs> that's the in, and then yes. the out is another four. Used to be an hour <laughs> back in the yeah, day. It's no more. But it, the other thing is, is there something that the state can do with any facilities that they have to make, um, you know, part of the part of the difficulty if you do have a staff in Boston is getting people together. If you're now scattered, and yeah, you can do it with. The, the computer, uh, you know, um, whatever, so between webinars and between conferences and so forth, yeah, you can do it, but let's face it, it's different. You know, having a conference call and conversation um, is different from being in the same room, and there are those times in which having people in the same room, ideas just flow, it's a little bit more relaxed, or it's something. I don't know what it is, but there's a difference. Is there a way that you can set up other facilities where people can go that are Remote or facilities, remote facilities yeah. where, you know, take them that way instead of that way, um, uh, whatever. But, I mean, there are far more creative people that can apply their brains to that. But, you know, I think it's going to take pulling out all the stops. Yeah. Otherwise, the economy will be in the toilet by the no time question. they finish it, you know. And then every, it'll take another decade for everything to start to, if, if it can come back. You know, but right next to, to transportation as as a major issue is the parallel issue, which is housing, and uh, you know an awful lot of what's happening and why certainly our congestion developed was because the affordable, and by that I mean market affordable. I don't mean subsidized housing. I mean f housing that the average person can pay for started migrating west, and so instead of buying in Natick, they were buying at first in, you know, the Holliston Ashlands, and, and then now the Upton, right. Upton and Uxbridge, and all the way out to the Dudleys, and all those people, all those people need a way to get in, and is there any conversation about the relationship between affordable housing getting closer all along the way? I did hear on the radio this morning there's actually talk about a rent control bill. And um, you know, imposing rent control, and I think, I think in some areas that that may absolutely be necessary. I, it even crossed my mind. So, what about rent control here in Holliston? I mean, let's just you know just toss that out because we're on this. I'm on this affordable housing committee, and it's like it's really, really hard when you hear some of the rents that people are asking for apartments that are old. I mean, there are antiquated apartments and that kind of thing. It's like, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd welcome the conversation. I'd, I'd start the conversation to say, okay, so 5% a year you can go up. You can't, go, can't do these 20% just because you notice the market is, you know, tighter. Mm -hmm. And there is a bill um, that, that one of my uh, colleagues, I think, from Cambridge um, yeah, supported. Actually, I think because, the, you know, the city folks in, in eastern Mass are really getting crushed, just the, the amount of development in mm -hmm. there around housing makes us, you know, out here have to look a little bit more carefully about what we're able to do, which is what I know you're doing on the Affordable Housing Committee. I think things like rent control, you know, absolutely we need to think out of the box. We need to talk about everything. I think at the end of the day, the real solution is supply, right? Yeah. It's a supply yeah, and demand supply problem. Thing. You yeah. know, the reason why the rents are so high is because there is, simply isn't enough housing for yeah. the number of people. Transportation is part of the solution so that people could live, you know, further out where things are more affordable and potentially commute into the city. I think the other part of the solution is let's move employers. You know, what can we do to move employers out this way so that people aren't having those kinds of commutes or satellite yeah. um, locations, which are actually, tr so, you know, starting to see because the, the uh, land is so expensive in Cambridge, for example. You know, they want to have their manufacturing with the large square footage out in our neighborhood. That makes sense. But the, you know, the address with the Cambridge. Right. You've got to keep your offices, your executive functions, so to speak. So I think there's a lot you can do with incentives and things like that. But creation of more housing is key. And we had talked a little bit about that, the governor's bill would uh, reduce the threshold at town meeting to vote on some of these zoning changes, which today require two-thirds vote, um, looking to relax some of the standards Where is around that bill? parking. So it was. It has been one of the governor's priorities. It mm -hmm. has been in the legislature for probably 20 years. Mm -hmm. It started out as maybe a 40-page bill, yeah, because I remember working on this bill <laughs> many years before I even contemplated running for this office, and now it's, it's a very short bill, yep. which seemed to have broad support, but all of a sudden now I'm hearing some municipalities are starting to raise concerns about municipal control. Um, so I don't know how big that group is um, yep. and what that level of concern is going to turn into, but any time, you know, at the end of the day, 
housing in Massachusetts is very much connected to municipalities. You know, yep. we've got a lot of authority. It's our zoning yep. that we do locally that really drives the ability to create housing. So I think this is a way that the state can, can start to support additional housing while working with communities and recognizing that at the end of the day, that's a, it's a community decision. Well, we're going to have the opportunity to have that discussion starting this May because the uh, Market Affordable Housing Committee is talking about looking at three bylaws, and we won't go into that at this moment, but we're talking about making some changes. So Holliston, you know, is going to have to step up and say, yeah, we are willing to you know, try to create a situation where there is an increase in the number of available units so that young people can live here or old people like me don't have to leave town to go someplace else that they can't afford. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. With or without the, the passage of the bill in the legislature, we're going to be doing that. And obviously it's harder. The, the bill in the legislature does those votes by majority, which is a whole lot easier to reach than mm -hmm. two-thirds. But at any rate, we will see what happens with that. But housing is integral to the whole yeah. transportation thing. Well, I think the important thing to remember, and, and people, when you talk about housing, it tends to be a very neighborhood-focused thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in your town, and you know... It's close. You know the neighbors, and you know what development means. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we need to recognize, to your earlier point about economic... Mm -hmm. um, vitality here in Massachusetts. Yeah. The lack of housing and the associated expense and the associated commute times for having to live very, you know, far distance from where you work is really starting to compromise driving away. our talented workforce. Yep. And if you look at states, and states have their calling card, right? You know, Texas has oil and um, other states have other natural resources that they have. Well, our resources are our workforce and talent. And if we have these educated uh, professionals that are moving to North Carolina or some other areas where they can live much closer to work, have a better quality of life with their mm -hmm. families, yep. that is a really significant concern for all of us. Yeah, it's a big So drain. I think, you know, yep. you need to recognize in, in our communities when you're weighing the types of changes that you're talking about, you know, there are two sides to this. Yes, mm -hmm. there will be a local impact on, on schools or mm -hmm. on other local needs, but, you know, long term we're all really... Uh, dependent on and would be well well uh, advised, I guess, to, to really think hard about our long-term future. Yeah, yeah. No, everybody wants to stay, it to stay exactly the same as it is just right. for them for this moment, and it won't be this way the next moment, so. And you want your children to be able to stay here, right? You yeah. Wanna... I mean, the, the ideal, I, I do live the ideal that both of my kids are here and their kids are here so far. I mean, they're starting to drift now, but, you know, yeah, it, it is the ideal. But at any rate, um, Okay, so we've, we've done the environment and the housing. Let's do something lighthearted, like, is there anything lighthearted? No, lighter, <laughs> not much we do with lighthearted. Well, right, the Women's History Trail let's is, do that is one lighthearted and, and uh, progressing. So we passed the creation of a Women's History Trail in the House in the fall. That's so great. It was a, a bipartisan bill, so I filed it with my Republican colleague, Hannah Kane, who represents Westboro with me. And... Uh, overwhelming support in the House, and now we're trying to move it through the Senate, which would allow individual cities and towns or individuals to put forward a nominee mm -hmm. um, who is a woman who contributed to either women's suffrage over the years or women's rights at large mm -hmm. to have a permanent memorial for her somewhere in the state, which could then be added to a statewide history trail, which would start at the State House. And then you could you'd have your little division is to create have your little um, you know booklet that you could chart your your yeah. tour around the state, learning about some of these incredible women who made an impact on Massachusetts. And even as part of this exercise, the stories that we heard about <laughs> women who have made tremendous marks on history, but just aren't recognized. You know, sure. you open a history book and you just don't see the names of the women like the names of the men, and I don't know exactly why that is. No, I don't either. You know, there are many, many contributions that women have made, so this is an opportunity for us to elevate those contributions. And there could be so many more uh, sort of synergies with that, like teaching about teaching kids in schools. Mm -hmm. You know, let's have our, our school children research local women. Um, who have done things right here in Holliston. And I think the his we... Historical Society is doing something in March about the oh, suffragettes, great. you know, and having, I think, um, four or five different women featured uh, 
Because yeah, we've got difference. the centennial. Yeah, we've got the suffrage coming up in that's August. That's right. Right. So something going on locally. So stay tuned for that. Um, let's talk about vaccinations. I know that one's not light and frivolous, but didn't we just have a was it MIT or one of the colleges, uh, the universities in Boston, where they have a student that had measles? And it's like, whoa, hey, when you think about how close everything is in there, um, having the, you know, having had measles and mumps at the same time, um, and whooping cough, it was just the greatest conflagration in one body. <laughs> it's just horrible. I was in the third grade. I remember it like yesterday. But, um, you know, it just boggles my mind. Everybody was thrilled that we were finally going to get rid of this threat, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, women who were pregnant who used to be nearly hysterical if they'd find out that, you know, some kid came home with, yeah. with measles and they were pregnant or whatever. I mean, it was just, it was not fun. It was not right. It was not good. It was not, you know, and I wish all you of these. You forget that. I mean, well, people the like naysayers, that was never even on our radar. You didn't live yeah. it, but I want to go to the naysayers and say, hey, folks, you know, what do you want to do? I lived through polio, too. I mean, mm -hmm. I, and where you wouldn't go to the beach, you just wouldn't go into the ponds and the lakes because you knew people who were living in iron lungs. So it's like, what is this? How are we, how are we addressing this? Mm -hmm. What are we trying to do? So there are a number of bills that would um, seek to address concerns about the increasing number of people who are not immunizing their children. Um, so if you look at the numbers in Massachusetts, uh, the stats are that, that lack of immunizations have increased, you know, five-fold over the, since the 1980s, which is now translating, you know, lack of vaccinations is one thing, but then when you actually start to see the cases of the measles, which right. we are seeing in communities, you know, not only across the state and the country, but also across the world. So right. measles is kind of seeing specifically a resurgence, but also other you know, other diseases that we thought were, were well contained are starting to kind of come back up. Yeah. So it's raised a lot of concerns in the public health community for obvious reasons about how do we deal with mm. uh, immunizations and what do we do about this rising number um, of people who are not immunizing their children. So I will say that I personally um, have gotten a lot, tremendous amount of feedback from our district mm. on this bill. And I had mentioned to you, and, and so what the bill would do, one of the kind of more high-profile bills, is it would remove the religious exemption for, uh, you know, not having your child immunized if you want to send them to the public schools. So there are two, um, two ways now that you can, can not have your child vaccinated. Mm -hmm. One is a medical exemption, and the other is a religious exemption. So there are currently five states. Uh, New York recently was added as a state that does not allow for the religious exemption anymore. Um, only the medical exemption. So that is what the bill would do. Um, I will say there's been a tremendous amount of communication and I would say pushback from a lot of parents who feel strongly that, you know, about their rights, understandably, mm -hmm. to not mm -hmm. immunize their children. That's so fine. Well, then they can stay away from mine. <laughs> when I think, you know, and I this, just, is, this is the question, seriously. you know, I think this is the kind of the, the area that we need to talk about. Everyone supports parents being able to yeah. make decisions for their children, but when they're going to a public school system yeah. where you have children with medical exemptions, for example, that can't be immunized, you know, how do you protect those children? And, and the other interesting piece of this is that, and I'm learning as much about this as anyone, is there's a, a herd immunity level. Mm -hmm. At so, 5%. Right. So once you start, your population starts falling below 95% yeah. immunized, then, then, you, then all, it sort of escalates off. dramatically and yep. exponentially. And we, and we have pockets hovering. But we know, have pockets already of communities where 5% has already been reached. Right. Okay. Collectively, no, but pockets. And I just, here, here's just the philosophical side of my brain, but we in the public in the world have a con yeah the conversation has switched from the words of public good public benefit public health okay we've gotten so individualized we've gotten so focused on our own whatever it is that we can no longer see the importance of the greater good the greater environment the greater the impact of what happens if you pollute this stream and what's going to happen downriver, or if you don't vaccinate this kid and he or she goes in and ends up involuntarily contaminating some population. We don't talk about the public good. That's it just drives me nuts. Okay. Well, and with this issue, I think you also, with global travel, yeah. you know, that adds a whole nother 
yeah. dimension of concern. I think, you know, I think this is this is not going to be a bill that passes quickly. I think there's a lot of conversations to be had. I personally would like to take a little bit deeper dive into what you mentioned, which is the fact that, you know, these these immunization rates are not the same across mm -hmm. the state. Let's go to those pockets where yeah, there's much lower rates and find out why. Yeah. You know, is it um, is it religious exemption? Is there something that we can do to kind of encourage mm -hmm. um, folks and I think that makes around sense. immunization I think that makes before sense. we take this kind of dramatic measure. Well, and, and, the, and the education that it would take. And unfortunately, people only learn by doing. And so maybe it requires having some sort of massive outbreak of something in some area before people start to realize that there is a relationship. Well, hopefully we can do it without oh, I know, that but point. But still. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So um, how about vaping? What are we doing with all that our tobacco products and stuff now that... Uh, Vaping's back in the scene. Right. So as you know, you know, vaping, a lot of health concerns with vaping, a number of people have, have died, died, even here in Massachusetts, but across, mm -hmm. across the country. So in the fall, we passed a bill that would eliminate the flavored yeah. vapes and flavored tobacco as well. And it's interesting to talk to some of the local health agents about the use of minors in particular yeah. around these vaping products. And, you know, going to some of these places where kids go and you just find, you know, hundreds of these pods, which are much more uh, intense um, in terms of, of smoking and what is actually inhaled than, you know, the, the cigarettes yeah. of old. Yeah. And the kids don't realize it. No. And there are some real health impacts. So we banned the flavors um, there. I've actually I've got the dates here. So the. Um, Let's see. Um, I want to make sure to get these right. So, for new contracts and agreements around, you know, purchases of these new vaping products in January 2020, so it took a, took effect already. In terms of enforcement and the excise tax, so there's an excise tax now, um, increased excise tax on the vaping products, which takes place in February. Okay. So, it, when people talk about these flavored products, do they ever talk about flavored alcohol and the fact that you can buy? Uh, bubblegum flavored vodka. Does this yeah. not bother anybody? Well, I mean, I would say it does bother people. You know, I think the, th the, th the thinking is, and I think there's plenty of documentation to support the fact that all of these flavor products are really intended to target a youth um, mm. audience and a youth market, which, you know, all of our age restrictions are trying to dissuade. So right now we're really talking about the smoking. Mm. Um, and what was included in this bill is menthol cigarettes, yeah. which is a pretty substantial yeah. change there that people are going to be getting used to. But, you know, the alcohol tends to be a whole different conversation. Yeah, it's a bigger, bigger group. Um, I had a question about the hands-free driving. Has that actually taken, taken effect? I mean, not being able to use your cell phone when you're... Um, yes, it takes effect on... Um, Enforcement starts on February 23rd, um, write that one down. <laughs> which means that you can be pulled over yeah. for any handheld use. So unlike the texting ban, which took effect yeah. in 2014, this is any swiping, you know, anything you do with your phone. So, for example, I finally set up my Bluetooth on my car, so I, uh, you know, yeah, I activate too. it with voice activation and talk without having anything in your hands. And then the actual enforcement piece, and so there are... Um, Fines, first offense, $100, second offense, $250, third offense, $500, uh, starts to be implemented in March. Those so this is a time to, to ramp up, you know, yeah, and kind of get used, get your car, get your technology all yeah. working, which took me a while. What happens if you have an old car? Can you get Bluetooth in an old car? Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. Like the little ear you know, oh, yeah. buds that you can connect to your phone. Okay. Okay. All right. Did we forget anything? Did we leave anything out? Well, the only other thing I thought I would mention, we've got a very active veterans population, mm -hmm. as you know, here Absolutely. in Holston and across the district. Uh, Massachusetts prides itself on being number one in veterans care, and I'm always surprised when veterans come in from other states at how robust um, they say that our services and supports here for veterans are in Massachusetts. But every Memorial Day and Veterans Day yep. in the legislature, we try to put forward new legislation to you know, further enhance support for uh, veterans, which we did in November for Veterans Day. And so the two elements of that, one was um, to address the PTSD in the veterans mm -hmm. community, which the statistic that you hear is 22 veterans a day take their lives as a result of uh, PTSD. And one of the even more dramatic statistics that I heard from the general who runs the home-based program 
um, run by the Red Sox Foundation for um, veterans uh, impacted by PTSD is um, 100,000 veterans have taken their lives since 9-11, which seems absolutely unconscionable to me. So we've there have been a number of things like the veterans courts that I think we've talked about before oh, as a way yeah. Such a great to program. get, you know, when veterans come in contact, it's a way to divert them and get them supports that they need. So this effort that we passed would create with UMass Medical um, Center a program for our public colleges and universities around really understanding the veterans culture within the university to be able to provide supports and train clinicians to be able to work with veterans who are using GI Bill benefits when they come out of the service to hopefully provide a you know a welcoming and supportive yeah, sort of a environment net, yeah. in yeah. that area. And then the other one, back to our Women's History Trail, um, there have also been many women who have served in the military over sure. the years that don't get, I think, the attention that they deserved. So in order to kind of highlight this issue, we. Um, created a group that will develop a memorial to Deborah Sampson. Does okay. that name ring a bell at all? No, no. So Deborah Sampson was a Massachusetts resident who served back in the Revolutionary War. And she, in order to serve, she had to dress up like a man. Oh, I've heard the story. So mm -hmm. she um, enlisted as a man under a name. She was found out. She had to de-enlist. She changed her name re-enlisted again as a man and actually served and was noted for her valor in combat and led many charges in, uh, you know, conflict uh, without anyone ever knowing that it was a woman. So she was injured in battle and because she was not able to be treated without being found out, she removed the bullet from her leg by herself using a pair of scissors and some tweezers, she actually extracted the bullet on her own. Um, so just an incredibly brave mm. woman that we really would like to elevate and show, mm. you know, that women have had these roles for a long time. So we're going to create some kind of physical memorial to her. Uh, I would love personally to see it be part of the women's trail, so we're going to be having, yeah. you know, conversations yeah. about that. But that was established, too. Uh, Interesting. In yeah, and there was a, in Siberia, they found a bunch of um, graves where they have women who were in full armor back 8,000 years. So the Amazons did exist. You know, the Amazon women yeah. as, as warriors really did exist, not necessarily just in the, in the Amazon, but there were three generations. They were a 50-year-old, a 30-year-old, and a teenager. Mm. Three generations all in their full garb, all women. I think it's important, you know, it's important to understand this history. I think yeah. we have a certain narrative in our mind yeah. that but, if you look at the facts, it's really a completely different yeah. story. Oh, I mean, I think it's true even for just women. I mean, you know, it's not just to say, oh, I think we need to understand and take it to heart as women and not be apologetic sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, about, I don't know what. But anyway, we won't philosophize anymore. Well, you've anymore. been leading the way, Mary. I mean, oh. you and your service to the town. And you, you too. Were... You too. You know, so anyway, we've had plenty of women around here that I've certainly admired and respected. So, all right. Anything else? I guess that's it. Just want to wish everybody a happy and healthy new year. You too. Um, you look too. Look forward to seeing you in a few months. Yep. We'll be back here in another couple of months, three months, March. And I, I just want to encourage anybody who may be watching at home, please share your thoughts. You know, feel free to contact the office. One of the ways that I stay plugged in and are able to represent the interests of the district is hearing from people on yeah, these, any the only of these way issues, any other issues that are important to you, please, yeah. please call. We'd love to hear from you. Well, it's the only thing that keeps you from living in an echo chamber. You know, if you don't hear from yeah. other people, then you're just living in that little bubble. So it's very important. It's part of being a part of a community. Okay, folks, that was it with a little bit of lecturing in there. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Take care. Have a good day. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.